Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to this episode of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author and PR consultant and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content events and training platform providing success strategies and resources for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Firstly, a quick announcement. I get a lot of people contacting me asking how they can work with me. So this is a little plug to let you know that I offer a range of services to vegan and plant-based business owners and entrepreneurs. From online training and group coaching to PR, content creation and copywriting services and one-on-one tailored individual private consultations. So if you're wanting help to promote or grow your vegan business, brand, product, service, book or other creative project, head over to veganbusinessmedia.com and click on the Work With Me menu link for more details. Now for the main part of the show. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be joined today by one of my favorite people, Jane Velez Mitchell. Jane is a renowned Emmy Award winning TV journalist and multiple New York Times bestselling author. Her decades long career as a reporter for mainstream TV in the US includes a six year stint hosting her own show on CNN Headline News, where she ran a weekly segment on animal issues. Since 2014, Jane has headed up her own vegan and animal advocacy media site, janeunchained.com. In February this year, that's 2020 if you're listening in the future, Jane launched New Day, New Chef, a plant-based cooking show on Amazon Prime. Welcome to the show, Jane. So happy to be here, Katrina. I love you. Oh, right back at you. Very, very excited about your new show and on Amazon Prime, which is absolutely fantastic. Tell us about the show, New Day, New Chef, including why and how you came up with the idea. Well, 20 years ago about, I ran into somebody from Food Network and I convinced him to take a pitch and I went in there and pitched a vegan cooking show. And of course, nothing ever happened. I won't say I was laughed out of the office, but... Uh, there's not a receptivity there and there wasn't back then. So I always had this dream of having a vegan cooking show because I've been on television for almost 40 years and um, much of my career was covering crime. I wanted to really do something to turn the world plant-based, which we need to do to prevent an ecological apocalypse in less than a decade's time. So Uh, We have been doing a show called Lunch Break Live here on Jane Unchained News Network, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. You can find out all about it at janeunchained.com. And basically, as soon as Facebook launched their live capability, we started doing live lunches, and uh, we've never missed a day. Uh, And it's there's so much versatility in vegan cooking that we've never really repeated a recipe without any planning just happened (laughs) that way. (laughs) And so you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different chefs not repeating a recipe. So we had gotten a lot of positive feedback for our lunch break live that is being done by different chefs all over the world. We've got a guy doing one day a week in Peru. We've got somebody else in San Diego. We've got people in Portland and all over the world. Tomorrow is going to be a New Yorker who's going to be doing lunch break live. So I had always had this dream of having a a major cooking show on television. Uh, I did a documentary called Countdown to Year Zero about the fact that if we don't transition to plant-based, we're going to basically make our planet uninhabitable in short order. And that's also streaming on Amazon Prime. And so um, I had met the person who was the Amazon distributor through a wonderful vegan actress, Gianna Simone. She has uh, a show on Amazon Prime called Love Gianna, where she interviews vegan doctors. And I said, hey, I said, I did this documentary about this incredible genius, Dr. Silas Rao, who wants to create a vegan world by 2026. And I really want to get it out there. Would you introduce me to whoever got your show on Amazon Prime? And she said, sure, because she's a generous, wonderful person. She introduced me to a great producer, Eamon McChrystal. He, by the way, is a former Irish tenor, and he's a multi-Emmy award-winning producer, just a, an incredible guy. So he put the, the, the documentary, Countdown to Year Zero, on Amazon Prime. 
And then we were chatting and it just came up that my dream had always been to do a vegan cooking show. And he said, well, we can make that happen. Wow. And I said, it's great. <laughs> I love now, that. <laughs> yeah. So we were, we're a nonprofit. Uh, Jane Unchained is a 501c3 nonprofit that relies on donations. So one of the reasons why a lot of people who have sizzle reels and plans for shows don't get them on is that they want to sell their show and make money. But as a nonprofit, we don't really we're not about making money. We're about changing the world. So the way we arranged it was we raised funds through the nonprofit, uh, people who wanted to see this happen. And there were so many generous people gave 5,000, 2,500, and uh, we're going to be doing it again. So keep that in mind. If you want to be a part of this, um, just reach out to me at jane at janeunchained.com. We'd love to have you know, this is a, a group effort. Uh, it was I would say 120 people were involved in putting the show on the air. Wow! And wow. so I don't want to take credit, um, not just the producer, but all the Jane Unchained volunteers who came, who worked the green room, who um, did all sorts of things, even holding signs so that people driving up would see that this is the studio, um, cleaning up afterwards. I mean, people really gave it their all, vegans who just want to see the show. So it's a great team, Jane Unchained team of just citizen journalists and volunteers and so anyway we raised so jane so jane did you let me just ask you did you then so did you raise the funds or decide you're going to go ahead and do this tv show and then find a place for it like amazon or did you already get the green light from amazon and then create it specifically for that platform well, it's also running on public television stations around the country. Oh, cool. And now it's also on, uh, I believe it's called Apple Plus. Uh, so oh. there's various platforms it's running on. But the point was we gave the content away. We didn't try to sell it. And that's where usually people run into a roadblock. I've done uh -huh. a lot of meetings in Hollywood, having lived here for 30 years, except for my time in New York. But um you know, it's hard to sell things. If people really like the idea, sometimes they go, we're already working on something like that. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, so that was our whole, our whole um, approach was just to offer it. And so uh, we did the first season, very successful. At one point, I think it was the fourth most watched cooking show on Amazon Prime. Wow. And that's, that's why great. it's expanded now from just being on in the uh, United States, England, and Ireland to being on the United States, England, Ireland, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So a huge number of English-speaking nations. And um, uh, we also did a second season, which is called New Day, New Chef, Support and Feed, which happened during the pandemic. So this insanely talented producer, Eamon, figured out a way to use six robotic cameras in the studio and create a contactless studio. And then I co-hosted from my home in LA. And then we had celebrity co-hosts co-hosting from their homes all around the world. Uh, Dynasties, Elaine Hendricks co-hosted from Atlanta. Emily DeRavin, uh, who's from the show Lost, was here in Los Angeles. Uh, Leslie Nickel, who plays Mrs. Patmore on Downton Abbey, was here in L.A., and uh, we just had tons of celebs, and the biggest celeb was Maggie Baird, who created Support and Feed, which is an organization that helps vegan restaurants stay afloat during the pandemic by getting donations. The vegan restaurants make the food, and then Support and Feed delivers the food to um, the hungry, children, seniors, uh, doctors, nurses, everybody struggling during this pandemic. So that's um, a win-win because we got the show on despite the pandemic and it's all for a really good cause to support, support and feed. Right. Got it. So you've done like season one and then you had to, you, you went to them and said, okay, well now we, we would like to put this special edition on. So now you're going to do a season two. Um, and so again, did you just go, kind of go back to them and say, right, we, we want to do a season two. And they were like, yeah, that's great. Cause I'm obviously happy that the show is doing well. Um, I don't do any of those communications. Honestly, uh, my EP, Eamon, is the guy who, you know, puts that all together. So my, my primary focus was to, you know, bring the team of volunteers and other people together and also some of the celebrities, you know, Elaine Hendricks, who is now on Dynasty as Alexis Carrington. She's a good friend. I've known her for a long time. Uh, I've known uh, Georgia Fox, who's going to be on one of the episodes popping up any minute now. 
And uh, she's a CSI actress. I've known her. She's an amazing committed vegan. So I was mostly involved in reaching out to my friends who uh, we live in a celebrity culture. You know, Mm -hmm. people want to see people who have big names. And we did get some really big names. In fact, Billie Eilish, one of the most famous people in the world right now, makes a cameo appearance along with her brother Phineas. Nice. Talk us through a little bit about the production, because obviously, you know, it's very different to Lunch Break Live, which is, you know, obviously got nice production values, but that's kind of done in your kitchen. This is obviously different. It's done in a studio. So when you say you funded it, so did you like go ahead and choose the studio and hire the studio and then get the specifications that you needed to make sure it was of network TV quality to do it? Well, uh, don't want to sound like a broken record, but I left it to aim and to handle all that. I mean, one of the things is when you know somebody in the business who's a pro, you can tell pretty quickly. I was in TV for 38 years. So I can tell when somebody doesn't know what they're doing. And I can also tell when somebody does know what they're doing. Right. And part of the trick is not to interfere. You know, keep your your, uh, paw prints off of it and let somebody who knows what they're doing do it. So I think that's a really important lesson because so many people feel like they've got to control everything, every last little thing. And it's like, no, when somebody knows what they're doing, let them do it. And so I did look at photographs of the studio. It's right here in Culver City. You know, there are sound stages that are independent sound stages that are not associated with a studio. I worked at one of the biggest studios and one of the most famous studios in the world, Paramount Studios. That's where I worked for 12 years because our local TV station was based inside Paramount Studios. So uh, I know what a big studio is like, but there are plenty of sound stages that are just independently run. They're giant sound stage with an area for a control room and a green room and uh, kitchens. Like this is uh, a a studio where other cooking shows are shot. So it looks great. And uh, we did um, have fun creating in season one, the taste testers. And also I was very involved in getting the vegan chefs I mean, they're the stars of the show. And uh, part of the, the, the um, fun part was being able to, to sort of reward people. There were so many people who had been on our cooking show as the Lunch Break Live, which involves a lot of work. You know, volunteers get together, they buy the food, they whip it up. Sometimes they test it, they write the recipe, they send it in with the still photos. Every single person who does a Lunch Break Live puts a lot of work into it. And I try to reward those people for their incredible volunteer work. So for example, there's just, just for one example, there's a woman named Erin Riley Carrasco. She lives in San Diego and she was voted PETA's sexiest vegan over 50. And she's an amazing cook. And she, she is just also really charismatic. And she does some, a, a, a show every Saturday on the Jane Unchained Facebook page called, um, Saturday snack down. So when we had to pick the chefs, uh, while sure we wanted to get a few uh, chefs that maybe are restaurant owners and high profile, we also wanted to reward some of the really good chefs that have really worked so hard. I mean, Erin works so hard. Her husband's a TV producer. He's the one shooting the Lunch Break Lives every Saturday and they're devoted. So she came on and did a segment. Elizabeth Alfano did a segment. But we also, she's a, a, um, a vegan um, radio personality who um, does a lot of radio interviews of high profile folks in the vegan world for Jane Unchained. And so she made uh, a dish, but we also got um, some celebrity chefs and restaurant owners, uh, people who are, I would say some of the top technically, you know, cordon bleu chefs who are vegan. So it ran the gamut. Um, I know I'm definitely not a chef, but I have learned so much watching these shows that I've done over the years. And one thing I've learned is very interesting, Katrina. I've learned that how you cook is a metaphor of, for your life. Oh gosh. Oh Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know. I don't know what that says about me. I avoid kitchens as much as I can. I'm a really good lunch and dinner guest because I love food being made for me. (laughs) Okay. There, there you go. Maybe you need to look at that. I don't know. I'm not your therapist. But for me, I burn everything. I'm a burner. In fact, one of my expenses is I burn these pots and I go, darn, I got to get another <laughs> why? Because I'm an impatient person. I want to do everything yesterday. I wake up in the morning and go, why isn't it done? We need to do this now. Yeah. So it's a reflection <laughs> of my personality. Also, it looks like a, 
a natural disaster when I'm done with uh, <laughs> cooking something. So there, there's another example. Fabulous. So Jane, in terms of, so what you're saying is in terms of uh, getting it onto Amazon Prime, you actually, you work with a producer who works there and they basically take care of that, <coughs> that production side of things. So it's not like. He doesn't you've... work there. Oh, okay. He, they have distributors, like people who have. A distributor, got it. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. But basically they take care of it. So it's not, so it's important for someone if they wanted to get a show of any kind, whether it's a cooking show, whatever, onto, you know, a network like this, they don't just kind of go off and make their own thing and hope for the best. You've got to partner with someone who knows what they're doing, a producer, and be guided by them in terms of the setup and everything. I think relationships are really important and I wouldn't pretend to be an expert, uh, but I will say this, there are companies that purport to get your product, whether it's a documentary, a film, or uh, any kind of show on these major platforms. And I know that if you go online and look at that, there's a lot of complaints about that. Um, oh, they said my thing is going up and I paid them X, Y, Z and I haven't seen it and I can't get in touch with them. I'm not saying they're all bad. In fact, once I did, a friend of mine who used to be in local news was with one of them and I ended up going to the office and talking to him about it. This is when it was kind of sort of new, I guess maybe, oh God, it had to be uh, eight years, some quite a few years ago when the idea of platforms and streaming on platforms wasn't quite as ubiquitous as it is today. So people were sort of getting a hang for what, what you do what, but yes, there are companies that will put your stuff, find a way to get your stuff out there, but it's, um, it's tough. It can be very tough and it can be very time consuming and it can drag on. And so, uh, I just feel that I was very lucky uh, to meet Eamon and hopefully we could do some more th stuff down the road. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit when you um, want to do something creatively and your primary goal is not to make a fortune. Got it. Now, you mentioned it's also available on public television. Can you say anything about how you managed to get it on that? Was that through Eamon as well or how did you get it on? It was, television? it was. And um, it's on about 27% of the country right now. And I was very thrilled to see some pretty big cities up there. Now, Public television stations are scattered throughout the country. And so if it says LA, it may not be in all parts of LA. It might be a, pers a portion of LA. Uh -huh. So um, the broadcasting um, region for each one of these public television stations is sort of almost like a district, right? You consider districts, voting districts. Well, these are broadcasting districts. Uh -huh. But yeah, we're, we're on about 27% of the country. And then I actually stumbled on the fact that it was on Apple Plus. Uh, I believe it was Apple Plus. Gosh, I don't want to miss, misspeak. But that's the idea, to get our content out everywhere. And you know, my message to vegan entrepreneurs is shoot it and get it out there. You can always graduate to a better platform, but there's nothing wrong with Facebook. We've been using it uh, for, well, ever since uh, 2015 when I started Jane Unchained, really the January 2015. I guess we started a month or two before that, but it was kind of in beta testing. Yeah. And uh, get your content out there because honestly, if somebody gets the information they need to change and evolve and get rid of uh, participating in one of the most violent and horrific industries, the animal agriculture industry, meat and dairy, it doesn't matter whether they saw that information that made the light bulb go on on Instagram or YouTube or Facebook or Amazon Prime or Apple TV or Roku or they saw it. They yeah. saw it. Yeah. With your, do you think your lunch break live did that have any uh, bearing on the fact that they that, that Eamon said yes because you already had something out there? I guess I'm trying to get to the point of you know is it is it a good idea for someone to put it out on those platforms so that then yes. when they do approach bigger ones they can say look I've had this show on Facebook Live or I had this show on YouTube Live and here's something for the for them to see. Oh, absolutely. I I look at all creativity as like a river. Uh, you start with maybe a trickle coming down a hill and then it gets into a creek. And then the next thing you know, it's a big river and then it's, then it's Niagara Falls. And you go right <laughs> off. But, but the point is you never know where it's going to go. It's like, if you do a creative project like writing, 
your first novel, you might want to throw it in the fireplace, but then that gives you an idea for your second novel or your first screenplay. By the way, I've had novels and screenplays that I've thrown in the fireplace, literally. So, uh, you know, but yet something about that experience informs your next project. And it's also good practice. And also by doing, you come up with great ideas. So, uh, it doesn't always have to be what I see is people begging for admission. And what I say is take the power back. Look at the Blair Witch Project. I mean, the Blair Witch Project, one of the most successful movies of all time, absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and it was shot on, you know, whatever, uh, the, the cheapest. I mean, it was shot on video. On that They incorporated the fact that it was shot on cheap videotape into the plot line and look how incredible it was. So they thought outside the box where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I just say, try to find uh, ways in like if you're water using the water metaphor analogy, again, water, that leak will find its way <laughs> through the ceiling <laughs> and uh, it'll find a way to destroy your uh, you know, uh, wall so water finds a way, we can find a way by being creative and thinking outside the box. And you never know, like you never know what the, what the result is going to be. I've been so pleased with uh, what's happened with New Day, New Chef and New Day, New Chef Support and Feed, which I really urge people to watch that one too. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole bunch of episodes out. There's now about 14 episodes you could watch and more are being added. We've got a couple more, a um, few more to add. Um, they come up, we never know exactly when they're going to come up. You submit them and then they pop up. And, um, you know, I, my, one of my big goals is to inspire like a food network. It doesn't have to be me. Just do a vegan cooking show. Mm. I don't care who you use. Use Tabitha Brown, who's fantastic. Use um, any number of great vegan chefs. I hope that once they see that and they see, wow, it's a lot of fun and boy, the food's pretty and boy, it looks delicious. And wow, mm -hmm. they're having a good time on set. We do a blender dance. Uh, here's, here's a way of turning a negative into a positive, Katrina. Uh, we, a lot of vegan food involves using the blender. And of course, it's very noisy. And even when you get a, a, a silent blender, there's still a level of noise involved. It's like, Rrr. yeah. So yeah. It, we decided, hey, Vegans use a blender. We blend a lot of stuff. Let's incorporate it. And we started this on Lunch Break Live, where when we turned on the blender, we would do a blender dance. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Well, we developed that on Lunch Break Live, and everybody knows about the blender dance. And when they use a blender, they dance around, and everybody laughs. So we decided to do it on the show, and everybody comments on it. It's one of the <laughs> best parts of the show. We, we dance every time we turn on the blender. I'm going to do that now. When I use my blender now, you got me. We'll start a trend. I think that's brilliant. And it's nice because it breaks down the stereotypes as vegans as being very serious and what have you. So I love that. So, Jane, how long will the show work? It's on Amazon Prime. So does it, like, stay there forever, or do you have to achieve certain targets? What, what kind of happens? Like, do well, all the episodes if, stay forever, and how does it if work? We, if we don't transition to a plant-based society, there will be no forever. I mean, we could make this planet uninhabitable for all the beings if we don't transition to plant-based. And that was the focus of my documentary, Countdown to Year Zero, which is also on Amazon Prime, which I hope everybody watches because it really lays it out. And it's not graphic, but it's super important information. We profile the work of Dr. Silas Rao, who is a systems analyst, a PhD from Stanford, who worked with Al Gore, but split with Al Gore because Al Gore won't talk about animal agriculture's impact. And he has since written a white paper that posits that uh, animal agriculture is responsible for 87% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that if we want to stop climate change, we need to transition to a plant-based society now. And he lays it out very clearly. So, um, I don't worry that much about long term. I don't know exactly. I don't think there's any forever in, in anything, but especially today, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow with this crazy pandemic and the, the bizarre uh, administration that we're dealing with. Uh, you don't know uh, what's going to happen from one day to the next, but my expectation is going to be on for the foreseeable future. I hope as long as, you know, I don't know nice. when I'm 100 and I hope to live to 100, it's going to be up, but <laughs> I, I haven't really thought about it. It's going to be up 
it's up, you know, indefinitely, let's put it. Yeah, and it's obviously expanding. It's great that, you know, it's obviously got been proved so popular that it's now expanding uh, to, to different areas, which is fantastic. Um, now, I just want to touch on, you know, you mentioned, so you you basically raised the money to do all the production, the high-end production for this show. In terms of, you know, with some cooking shows, there's like product placement. So do you do any of that no. or are you allowed to do any? No. Of that? No. Why, why not? It's just against the rules. And oh, I okay, right. To keep it pure. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons just in general terms why subscription-based television is a good way to go for vegan content is it's not advertiser-based. And if you wonder why a food network is going to be reluctant to do do vegan cooking shows, all you have to do is look at the TV commercials in between the segments. Mm. And, And what are TV commercials generally? I don't watch the food network, but I happen to watch MSNBC. And uh, what I see are meat, dairy, pharmaceutical commercials with an occasional car commercial and an insurance commercial. And uh, everybody seems to have a very upset stomach where I have to (laughs) mute. I do. I'm like, oh, it's almost a comedy. I said, this would be a skit. Every time the the commercials go on, it's it's a litany of horrific either side effects from a drug. Yes, I can't believe that in American ads. It is bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Gross (laughs) malady that somebody's having. And I'm like, who are these people that they're so (laughs) sick and they've got gas and they've got this, that, and the other. Um, And it's disgusting. I have to mute (laughs) <laughs> so I don't hear these gross commercials. It's terrible. Right. Okay. Now I just wondered whether that was a potential avenue of funding. So that's not allowed in subscription TV, but in, in places like main, like big networks, like the food network, then you would have either product placement or advertising. Uh, well, there's advertising it's commercials. Yeah. In between the segments on, uh, yeah, got it. That, that television, mm-hmm. but I don't know all the nuances, but I really do hope that, whether it's the Food Network or the Cooking Channel or some other show. Look, the great thing is when you go on Amazon Prime, you see a lot of other shows that are vegan. And we mentioned uh, Love Gianna. And there's all sorts of, I don't want to quote them here for fear of making a mistake, but you'll see people who like this also liked. And there's tons of vegan content. We're going to have a global watch party. I hope you guys will take part. But what I urge is watch this Watch these shows with your friends who are pre-vegan. I don't say not vegan. I say pre-vegan. Pre-vegan, yeah, I like that. I use we've that all too. always yeah. got to go uh, toward veganism. And there's something else that's very exciting I want to talk to you about. Um, so just let me know when because we're starting something new that's very exciting. Oh, okay. Right. What, are you, can, I, can, can you say that now or is it? Yes. Yeah, uh, okay, I, go. Yeah, okay. tell me about it. Tell yeah. me about it. Yeah, it's called... <laughs> Plant-Based Neighbor, and it's a new app that... uh, Oh, yeah, I signed up for that. Yes, thank you. And uh, so we urge you to ask, sign up, plantbasedneighbor.com. It's now in beta testing as a website, and we keep improving it based on user experience. And then very soon, we're going to launch it as an app. And it's going to connect vegans uh, and vegetarians. uh, Hopefully, they're on the journey transitioning to veganism. Uh, vegans and vegetarians around the world. And uh, so uh, this is going to be great because we want to inspire the veganomy. So for example, there are certain things that almost everybody has to purchase and services they need to use and they need somebody in their immediate vicinity, right? So a hairdresser, a handyman, a plumber, maybe an accountant, maybe a bookkeeper, maybe a, a personal trainer. Well, if you're vegan, you want to give that money to another vegan assuming they can do the job so that the person you're paying isn't going to go out and buy a steak with the money that you've raised. So this way people put in their professions as well. So uh, I can get a V I do have a vegan hairdresser. I haven't seen her in four months because of the pandemic. So I'm glad this is audio only, but, uh, (laughs) but, um, and then her, then she told me, yeah, my boyfriend's a handyman and he's a vegan handyman. So then he's my handyman. Then he told me, yeah, there's a vegan painter because I have to do some paint touch-ups. And he said, yeah, I know a vegan painter. So it makes me very pleased to give money to people who would do the work that I need to have done, which everybody needs certain things, like hopefully a hair, hair cutter or whatever. And uh, I can give that money to a vegan. Now, the way um, 
we expand that is then in numbers. If you think of lines all the way across the world connecting all these vegans, wouldn't that be powerful? So I'm urging everyone to sign up to Plant Based Neighbor at plantbasedneighbor.com. And then when it's an app, it will be uh, something that you can click on and um, really have a community yeah. uh, and never feel alone in your neighborhood, even as I am surrounded by, you know, meat barbecuers and, and it's often difficult with the stench of, I smell death, they smell uh, yeah, whatever. I get it, and yeah. so now knowing just from this that I have at least two vegans in my neighborhood um, is great. And uh, one person found 162 vegans in their neighborhood. Oh, wonderful. Well, we'll put a link to that for sure. Can I just go briefly back to the, the show? Give us an idea, because I noticed the episodes are about 22 minutes. Give us an idea, how long approximately does it take to produce an episode? I think just like, give people a realistic idea, like in terms of you've got to get to, this is obviously pre-COVID, but you, know, you got to the studio and you did the recording um, and then obviously it's edited. R- roughly how long does it take to produce a 22 minute e- episode like that? Well, let me just say that it's kind of like painting a wall, preparation, preparation, preparation. Actually, the preparation is really the hard part, finding the right guests, making sure they're available, making sure that they make different dishes, right? Figuring out which dishes they're going to make that are appealing. For example, um, you want colorful dishes. You want dishes with color. So if somebody wants to make a chocolate cake, not to say that we didn't have one. We actually had a chocolate ice cream pie in the second, uh, ad- the support and feed edition. But generally, we'd want to have something that's pink or uh, colorful. And uh, so th- all of that involves uh, coordination. You also want something that looks good. Food is very, very tricky because it can look really disgusting if it's not handled right. That's why they have these people who are called food stylists who make a good living styling food for still photographs. So um, there's all that coordination. Then what, what do people wear? You want to make sure they don't wear like stuff at mores or something with a label on it. And you might got to make sure that they know where to go and uh, that they know how to park. One of our biggest issues was the parking. And that's where the volunteers came in. Some of them had to drive up and park their cars really early so that the parking spots weren't taken. And then when some of the guests who were going to be on camera came in, they were ready to move their cars. So because when you have a lot of people, if you're not in a place that has a ginormous parking lot, when you consider the crew and the volunteers and then the guests and there were a lot of people there was there were well over 100 people involved in the show so a lot of the things that you you how to feed the crew okay the crew goes on a break they have to have that food there ready to eat so they can eat and then get back to their job if you don't feed the crew you're you know and of course we wanted to feed the crew vegan food mm-hmm. so we um went and got vegan food from some great vegan restaurants and somebody one of our great volunteers was in charge of making that sure that food was picked up and it was brought back and it was ready for the crew to eat and made sure that uh not that people didn't bring a lot of guests with them because you have to keep quiet in a studio and if everybody brings two of their best friends and their mother and their sister it's a madhouse and then they're they're online for the food that's meant for the crew. There's a lot of coordination and you want to make sure all of this is really planned out so that it's smooth. Mm. And part of relaxing on a set is when people are professional and they've worked out all these details and the logistics prior to, you can relax and have fun because the hardest part is done. Oh, that's really good advice, actually. So are you there for like a day, like in terms of the recording side of it? Is it a few hours? Is it a full day typically? Or is it very- we, did, uh, we did two episodes a day. Ah. Oh. Uh, and in the next one, we may have done, we did three episodes because that the next one we were dealing with a contactless studio and we really had to get in and out. We couldn't have it go on and on. So the first one was two episodes a day. And then the second one, I believe, was three episodes a day. So we were, you know, I did not go in for the second season. I stayed re- anchoring remotely here, hosting remotely from my uh, home nearby, but I was in LA, but I didn't go in because wow. we, we wanted to make sure everything was very, very, very safe. So it was, yeah. it was really, that's what I said. There was a, there was a mo- giant monitor put in the studio so that the chef 
could talk to me and my co-host uh, while he or she was cooking. And so we were there on a big screen and then we'd ask questions and they would answer, the chefs would answer. And, you know, that's a lot of coordination. There's a wow. lot of switching and technical stuff that needs to be done. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really helpful for people to know. And of course, you know, if somebody is a, a solo chef, so they may be not getting, because obviously you had a lot of guests and stuff, or if someone just wants to get their own show where it's just them as the chef, they've still got to be prepared, like you say, to make sure all of that production side and the logistics, it's all kind of taken care of. I mean, uh, yeah, you think about logistics, there's a lot of logistics. First of all, the person has to bring their food prepped and a final product. Because the first thing you want to do is shoot the final product to show the pretty finished version. Uh -huh. And then you start cooking from the beginning with the ingredients. And then, for example, sometimes you put it in the oven and woof, the miracle of television. <laughs> about two seconds later, <laughs> well, actually that was cooked the night before. It was right. brought in. It was kept looking really pretty. So, you know, everybody has to bring their food and they have to remember to bring the one that they cooked the night before or that morning and they have to bring all the ingredients and then the set has to be cleared so while one part of the crew is having lunch you know the others cleaning out making sure everything is pristine and so it's really um there's a lot of logistics involved yeah and, did you have to do a lot of free takes like as well no like it was as live Oh, so, really? Wow. And that's, that's another thing that I like is that, okay, one of the reasons As Alive is good is that you feel like it's live. Keep going. Like, <laughs> sure, if you really, you know, if you really trip up, you start again. But the, the point is when somebody knows they can do something 20 times, they're going to do it 20 times. Right. If they know they can't do it but once, maybe twice, if it's absolutely <laughs> necessary, yeah. you're, you're really much more alert. And also there's a certain spontaneity and authenticity there that doesn't come across when something is pre-taped. That's you a know, good like, point. Yeah. So we did it as live. And, and that's why we had a lot of fun. We just kept going. Love it. I love it. Well, we're looking forward to seeing many more seasons. We'll put links um, to the show where it's available. So it's free for members who are based in the US, members of Amazon Prime. Um, otherwise, if you're outside um, or certain places, certainly in Australia, you can buy it. Um, and I, I presume people can buy it in those, yeah, wherever those areas are that it's available. So we will put links to all of those um, so people can check it out. So do check out the show because, you know, the more viewers it gets, the more popular it is, the more likely these networks will uh, have even more vegan content, which is what we want. So thank you again, Jane, for being, again, oh. a pioneer. You've been a pioneer your whole career. I love that you said 20 years ago you pitched this and you've come full circle and, and got it out there, which is absolutely amazing. Thank and if people like it, please write a review. Right, um, okay, yes. Write, give it yes. five stars because that helps it go up and be visible to more people. Oh, That's good point. Super important. Definitely. All right. We'll definitely do that. Thank you so much for being on the show, Jane. You've been absolutely great. I love what you do and just getting the vegan word out there. It's just wonderful. And thank you for sharing some insights into the behind the scenes, which I think is going to be really uh, important for people. So it's been absolutely, again, always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Katrina. I love you. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. If you like the show, please give it a review on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on as it helps to get it seen by more people. There are more free resources on the veganbusinessmedia.com website to help you in your quest to build and sustain a successful business. And if you'd like to work with me personally on promoting and growing your vegan business or brand, you'll find details on how to do this on the website at veganbusinessmedia.com and clicking on the Work With Me menu link. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now. Thank you.